what is social attention? Well, all of us have come across a situation like this before. You see somebody looking up, and all of a sudden you're interested in what they're looking at, and then all of a sudden there's a massive crowd around you, and everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. Okay? So this is a really strong bias that we have. We're intrinsically interested in where other people are directing their attention. So that's what social attention is, at least that's how I'm talking about it today, is the intrinsic interest in where other people are directing their attention. Why do we care? So what's special about social attention? Why do we, why do we research, do research on social attention? Well, it's actually one of the first uh, developmental milestones that you see in uh, children. It is something that emerges so early on in typical development that it's considered to be almost a building block of social development. So it's a, a fundamental skill in social development. Um, and as a result, so we think that social attention is a pivotal skill for developing these types of skills and cognitive skill sets. So uh, essentially, social attention promotes social learning. And as a result, language is acquired, um, social cognition is acquired, and social competence is acquired. So these are all thought to stem from these basic processes of social attention. So what's the evidence for this? Well, we know that early social attention in infants predicts later language <coughs> development. Okay, So um, these types of skills are actually predictive of later language development in, in typically developing kids. Um, and the idea behind this is that what's happening with social attention, when we follow where somebody is looking, we're creating a shared frame of reference for, and that opens up opportunities for word learning. Okay, so if mom is looking at an object and she labels it juice box, that's a, a learning opportunity for that child. Okay, so that's why being aware and being interested in where someone else is directing their attention is a huge opportunity for language development. Um, we also know that social attention contributes to social competence. It's also kind of uh, intuitive in nature that it would. Because social attention, when we coordinate our attention with other people, we're showing interest in what they're doing. And, and what they're learning about in the world. And as a result, we learn about the world. So you, you create social bonds by actually coordinating your attention with that of other people. So this is a really important skill. What's happening in, in ASD? So this is actually one of the earliest clinical signs of autism, that there's an impairment in social attention or, or abnormalities in social attention. So we know that kids with ASD are less likely than typically developing kids to appropriately follow the head turn of an adult, the pointing gesture of an adult, and pointing combined with looking. Okay, so all this stuff is kind of abstract right now. I'm going to actually show you a video of what this looks like. Okay, so this is a typically developing little guy. So pay attention to what's happening on the right side of the screen. There's an experimenter. She's hidden because she's behind the camera. Um, but she's going to do something, and you watch the child's response. Oops. So let's look at autism. This is a little guy with ASD. Okay, so this is different, right? So this is one of the earliest clinical signs that something might be off. This has led to the social attention theory of ASD. So this theory has been around for a while, but it's gaining more and more clout as more and more research comes out. Okay, so this is the idea that atypical social attention, so the prioritization of attending to and processing social information, impedes social learning, okay? And as a result, language acquisition, social cognition, and social competence suffer, okay? So this is work by Peter Mundy and Geraldine Dawson. They've been developing various um, versions of this hypothesis. Here's a little model. I had this before. Social tension leads to all these great skills. Well, 
if this is impaired, then these skills, the opportunity for these skills to develop is impaired. Okay, so that's the thought. Evidence for this? Um, well, we know that you know the extent to which children with autism exhibit social attention is a strong predictor of language development, symptom severity, their development of the theory of mind, and also their long-term social and communication deficits. So if you measure that variability in, in your children with autism, you'll see that this skill predicts a lot of these, um, these cognitive skills. How do we measure social attention? Well, I showed you an example of how you might elicit a social attention response. You can have an experimenter sitting across from a mom and baby or child, and then you know, the experimenter will do, they'll establish eye contact with the child to make sure that they're paying attention to them, and then they'll avert their head, their head turn, or, or just their eyes, depending on what the paradigm is. Or they might point and look. Okay, so you see here, she's actually looking to the left, and it's hard to tell that she's actually looking at this object. So there's an object on the left and there's an object on the right. And this baby is, you know, very <laughs> intent on what she's doing. And then he or she follows the head direction. Okay, so this is one of the main paradigms, in fact, the main paradigm for studying this in really young children. Okay, so this is, I call, a naturalistic study of gaze following or social attention. This is a great paradigm. It's told us a lot about social attention, but there are some limitations to this approach. Okay, one of them is that because it's in a natural environment uh, and it's delivered by a human, this, this cue, you, you do lack precise control over the timing of these cues. So there are some issues with regards to you know, how long the cue might, might appear. If you want to control for that, that's kind of difficult, okay, because it's a, it's a real person. Um, Maybe more importantly for what I want to talk about today is that it's not really appropriate for older children, right? So you, you can't imagine designing an experiment with you know, an 11-year-old where they're sitting across from an experimenter and then she looks at them, makes sure they're looking at him, and then turns her head, okay? It's not really feasible for, for studies with older kids, okay? They're going to figure it out right away and they're not going to participate. As a result of this, most of what we know about social attention, and in particular social attention in autism spectrum disorders, is from research with infants and toddlers, because that's the age group for which this paradigm is appropriate. Um, so there's very little research on school-aged children. So there's not a lot that we know about how social attention operates in school-aged kids and adolescents. So, as a result of this, in part of this, of course, most of the interventions that are aimed at social attention and improving social attention are geared towards really young kids. Okay, So there aren't interventions targeting social attention in older children and adolescents. They just don't, they're just not there. What researchers decided is that they needed a paradigm that can be used across a variety of age groups, from <coughs> young to old. I'm going to walk you through this paradigm in a very simple way. So this is, it's called the gaze cueing paradigm. Adrian knows this one very well. Um, so you have a computer screen, you have two potential target locations, okay? A target's going to appear on either the left box or the right box, it's an, it's an asterisk. And here's a schematic face, it could be a photograph of a face or just a drawing, and it's looking to the left or to the right, okay? And your job is to hit the space bar as soon as you detect that star that asterisk, which is the target. Okay, so what happens? This is a trial, so initially there's just nothing going on. Then the pupils show up. This, lo and behold, this person is looking to the right. And the target appears, okay? So this is called a cued target trial because their direction of gaze cued where the target was going to appear. Here's the opposite of that. Right? So this is when the target appears at the opposite side to where the face looked, okay? an uncued target trial. So without going into too much detail about this, what people have found using this paradigm across a variety of ages in typical development is that people are faster to detect the target when it was looked at previously by the face. Okay? So cued reaction times to detect that target are faster than uncued reaction times. And that's 
indexing that attention was oriented in response to where those eyes were looking, okay, which facilitated target detection. So that's this attention effect. We can't ignore these cues. These cues, so in this particular paradigm, they tell nothing about where the target is going to appear. It's random, okay? The, the person can be looking either left or right, and it's completely random with respect to where the target shows up. So even so, people follow this cue. They use it, even though it's not helping them. In theory, it shouldn't be helping them with the task. So this is suggesting this reflexive tendency to attend to where other people are looking. So we can't really stop it. It's reflexive. Not surprisingly, um, researchers began to apply this to older individuals and younger individuals with ASD to see if this, they would find examples or evidence of absent or reduced cueing effects. Because if we think about autism and our understanding is that there's a, a lack of um, joint attention or social attention, we would expect that there would be no difference between cued and uncued trials. They would just be, they wouldn't orient in response to where the eyes were looking. So that was the expectation. So time and time again, people are finding essentially normal looking cueing effects, meaning that people with ASD are orienting in response to these non-predictive, meaningless gaze cues. Okay? So this is, you know, the vast majority of studies are finding this. Okay, 13 out of 17 are finding this, you know, basically equivalent orienting effects in autism. So that was unexpected. And it's not surprising that more and more research is being done because people are still trying to figure out if this is real, is this actually happening. This is also true for children who actually in real life show severe impairments in social attention. So this particular study um, and there's also another one that was done in Japan by Okada and colleagues. They did a pretest of real world joint attention. So they did part of um, the ADOS, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, and part of that ADOS involves pointing to something and seeing if the child responds. So the vast majority of these kids with ASD did not respond to that cue. However, put them in this paradigm and they're showing this robust cueing effect. So that's a bit contradictory, right? We expected them to not show this effect if this is tapping into social attention. So what's going on? We've got conflicting findings. Studies from this type of paradigm are revealing very different results than what we see in more natural paradigms, naturalistic paradigms. So what's going on? Well, <coughs> this is where my research comes in. <sighs> My, one of my hypotheses has been that actually there are two stages of social attention. And this is just based on sort of observations of how we interact in the real world with social information. Okay, so clearly we've got, you know, a situation here. <laughs> and she's not very happy, and you can tell she's looking at them and she's pretty mad. Okay, so what's the first stage? First, we select her <coughs> eyes. We, pay it, we orient our attention to her eyes. We pick them out. Then, we shift our attention to where those eyes are looking. Okay, so these are two distinct stages in the social attention process. However, the cueing paradigm that I just described and all the results that come from it is only designed to examine the second stage of social attention where people are orienting their attention from the social cue to wherever it's looking. Okay, so there is really no selection process because the cue itself, which is this eye gaze cue, the face, has been pre-selected for the observer. So there's nothing else to select on the screen. It's in the center of the screen where they're already looking. They're, they're selecting it, right? There's no competing information. They can't, you know, they can't look at other things on the screen. And that's it. So basically, they're forced to select this cue and its direction which is fine because that's what this, this paradigm was only designed to test the shift from a directional cue to where it is looking. My hypothesis was that even though that's a useful paradigm for studying that, that stage in social attention, we're kind of missing out on a really important aspect of how social attention operates in the real world, okay? So my hypothesis has been that much can be learned about social attention if we actually measure this first stage of social attention, which is that initial selection of social information, in this case, her eye gaze, okay? So 
the selection of eyes can tell us, hopefully, about some interesting things that are happening um, in social attention. How do we do this? One of the ways we do this is with eye tracking. This is what I did in my PhD. I used this machine. <laughs> it's been replaced by fancier ones now that don't require you to wear something on your head. But, uh, and actually I have one of these now, so I'm excited to get going on that research. So this is one way we can measure what people are selecting in the environment is we measure where they're looking. So here's an example of what that might look like. So this green dot is somebody's eye movements. Okay? So they're checking out the people, then they start going to the background, making a lot of fixations on the eyes. Face, body, everything. Okay? So that's an example of the type of data you would get from using an eye tracker. So my question was that, was do typically developing observers preferentially select the eyes from complex scenes? At the time, this was not well understood. This was in 2008 when this was published. Um, because most of the research had been done with really artificial stimuli. So I wanted to throw some scenes at people and see, is there a preferential bias? Do we actually select people's eyes preferentially over other things in the picture? Okay, that was the first question. The second question was, do typically developing observers select the eyes to determine people's attentional states? So do we understand that eyes tell us about where people are paying attention? Okay, I'm going to show you how I did that. I had three tasks. One task was to just look at the picture. You don't have to do anything, just look at it. The other task was to describe the picture. Tell me what's going on in the picture. The third task, this is the critical one, was a task tapping into social attention. So where are people in the picture directing their attention? And tell me how you know that, okay? Importantly, in this instruction, there was no mention of looking, there was no mention of eyes, there was no mention of eye gaze. So there are a variety of cues that people can use to figure out where someone is paying attention. You can think about what they're doing, what they're looking at, how their posture is, etc. Right? So what we wanted to know is do they automatically ramp up their interest in the eyes as a cue for social attention, which was not necessarily something to be taken for granted. Add some scenes. I'm just showing you how I divided the scenes up into regions of interest. So we've got objects, bodies, faces, eyes, background. I spent a lot of time clicking on regions of interest. <laughs> That was a huge part of my doctoral research training, <laughs> is clicking. This allows us to look at how frequently people look at these different regions of interest. I'm going to show you fixation proportion. This just means the, the overall proportion of eye movements that fell into each region. Here we've got the different regions of interest. And I'm going to plot this as a function of task. There is an overall bias to select the eyes over other types, other regions in the scene, it is ramped up for the social attention task. Okay, so when people are asked about attention, they start looking at the eyes more. I'm going to show you some examples of what that looks like with some fixation plots. Again, these are eye movements. So this is somebody who's just looking at the picture. Now they're describing it. Again, interested in the face, interested in the eyes. Social attention. So you see how things just kind of zone in on, on the eyes for that particular task. Here's another example. So we've got look, describe, social attention. Okay, so these are task modulated effects of um, gaze selection. In summary, there is a bias to select eyes regardless of task. It's enhanced when you're asked to infer attention. So tell me where people are attention, paying attention, they will start looking more at the eyes. Um, so this suggests that people understand the <coughs> eyes to have important information about where people are directing their attention. And importantly for this presentation today, gaze selection is a key component of social attention. Okay, so this was a way of sort of demonstrating that measuring gaze selection tells us about an important process in social attention. Let's talk about autism. So then I applied the same kind of approach to people with ASD because it was not clear at that time whether or not they would also show this pattern of being interested in the eyes as a source of attentional information about other people. 
So again, I've got some scenes. Questions. Is the bias reduced in autism overall? Do people with ASD look less at the eyes? That would be consistent with what we understand to be the, one of the clinical profiles of ASD, especially in young infants, um, is a disinterest in other people's eyes in general. Do they understand that the eyes have important information about where people are directing their attention? And do they use that information? Um, so again, we had three different tasks. A neutral task this time, instead of just the look task, it was just what kind of room is this? What's going on? You know, what kind of room? Is it an office? Is it a lounge? Describe, okay, describe the picture. And then again, social attention. Where are people in the picture directing their attention? So what we see, this is just a plot of every image that I showed in the experiment. This is the proportion of time on the eyes. The white dots are typically developing, well, they're, sorry, they're control participants that, without autism. And then the black dots are autism. Okay, so what this is showing you here is actually, like most autism research, it wasn't very clean, meaning that you do find a, a general reduction in interest in the eyes, but only for some pictures, not for all of them. So future research needs to figure out, well, what's going on in those pictures to drive this? but uh, essentially suggesting that there's a lot of variability in terms of these different uh, ASD-related differences and where people are directing <coughs> their attention. When we look at task, what we saw was that here are the typically developing controls. They show this similar to what I showed you before, this ramping up of time on the eyes, which is plotted here, for the social attention task relative to the other tasks. Not so for the people with ASD. Okay, so that use of the eyes was not there as an attentional cue. This is an example of a heat map for one of the images that was particularly, um, in, you know, it was one of the ones that produced differences, and I'm not entirely sure why. So we've got this sort of, this is a heat map, so warmer colors index more time spent looking at that particular region of the scene. So we've got typically developing individuals looking mostly at the eyes, and then we've got the ASD group focusing more on the mouth. They still look at the eyes, but a little bit less than they're typically developing. I've already mentioned that this only a subset of scenes produce anything of interest, but the critical thing was that the task-related modulation of where people look was not there in autism. So they didn't seem to ramp up their fixations on the eyes to figure out where people were directing their attention. I'm coming to my thesis which is that the most striking aspect of the social attention or abnormality in autism is not whether or not they are processing or how they process social cues when they've already been selected for them. Okay, it's, it's actually the difference lies in the likelihood or way in which people with autism select such information in the first place. Okay, so if you put a cue up and you make it central and there's nothing else going on, that's not going to be a problem for somebody with ASD. But my research and several other studies have shown that there's this initial selection process and use of the eyes and interest in, in the eyes is what's different. That's the thought that I've got. So with this in mind, I thought, OK, well, I've done a lot of picture or a lot of uh, studies with static images of people. They're not very social. I mean, the, the people don't interact with the participant. It's just sort of bland in terms of social agency. So I thought, okay, let's, let's try to examine these two processes, um, gaze selection and gaze following in a more ecologically valid setting. This is an eye tracker. It's a mobile eye tracker. So this thing just sits on your face um, like a pair of glasses or goggles, and there's a camera that's looking out at the screen or sorry, out at the world, my apologies. So this is really taking a bird's eye, or a, sorry, a first person perspective of what that individual is looking at. And then there's a camera that looks down at this reflector that's essentially taking an image of the participant's eyes, or one eye, excuse me. And what it's doing is it's, it's using this fancy algorithm to superimpose these two video feeds and you calibrate it so that it knows where the participant's looking in the real world. So there's a calibration procedure, and then they can just, this child or participant can just interact with the experimenter, and we have a good sense of where they're looking in that environment. So I'm going to show you an example of that shortly. 
Um, so, but just to tell you what the goals of this study were. Um, we wanted to observe social attention in an, an interactive task designed to measure spontaneous shifts of social attention. So we wanted this to be a really natural setup where there was no sort of artificial nature of the, the cues being delivered. And I'll explain to you how we did that in a few minutes. Um, the question, what, one of the main questions was how do children with ASD select and follow social attention cues? So how do they initially select that information and then use it? What is the nature of a typical social attention in ASD? Is it at both stages or is it at one of, one of the stages? Does one affect the other? So we're trying to measure these things separately in a natural, ecologically valid setting to get a sense for if there's, any, if there's anything that's atypical in ASD, what is it? So this is research in collaboration with Dr. Grace Hirochi. She's uh, at the ADDL at SFU. Method. So far we have 26 participants. We're still collecting data. It's taking a while. Um, but we have 17 participants with ASD, high functioning, meaning their IQ is over 80. Um, and we have 11 typically developing children, um, matched for group level IQ and age. We've got 8 to 15 year olds. These are the participants in our study. Mean age of each group was matched at 11.7 years for the autism group and 11.8 years for the typical group. What did we do? Well, we had the child wearing an eye tracker. That's not a child. It's just a picture from the internet <laughs> using that eye tracker, just to show you that they can wear it, and it's fine. Um, and playing it a card game. So they either played Uno or the game Go Fish. They could choose whichever one they wanted. And then they played it with an experimenter, Krista, Krista Johnston. So she, you'll see an image of her shortly. So importantly, the design of this experiment was such that Krista would pseudo-randomly avert her gaze. Okay, so they'd be playing naturally and then you know he would take a turn and then it would be up her turn next and she would look off. Okay? And she held this cue for 10 seconds or until this, this child responded. Okay? So if they immediately detected what she was doing and followed where she was looking, she ended that cue. But she gave them a lot of time to notice it so that if there was any delays there that they could actually um, notice that she was averting her attention. But it was really nice and natural looking and nobody that we've run has ever said, okay, what's going on in your experiment? Or, you know, we asked them afterwards, did you notice anything funny? And all of them say no. You know, you know, I thought you were a bit distracted, but that's about it. So it's, it worked nicely in terms of not seeming like a, a, a setup, right? Again, we want to know, do people with ASD and typical kids, do they spontaneously monitor where, where their play partner is paying attention? It's kind of an important cue, but what happens in a real social situation? Is that actually something that people pay attention to and, and monitor? So just to show you a quick sketch of the room, so we've got, we've got this couch over here, we've got the child or the teen sitting on the couch, here's a coffee table with the cards or whatever game they're playing, here's Krista. She's facing them and dealing the cards. Then around the room we have a whole bunch of objects, interesting things to look at, so it's not just her on the in, in front of them, right? They can look at other things too. And then we've got me over here, and um, I'm monitoring the eye tracker and making sure it's not offline or doing something crazy, but it's also the case that she sometimes looks at me. So when she turns her head, she can look at me or she can look at an object in the room. So we kind of varied that across the trials. And then we've got cameras, high-def webcams, um, um, recording what's going on in the room, in addition to the eye tracker. So we have a lot of cool data that we're still analyzing. <laughs> I'm going to show you an example of a video of a child. This is a little guy with ASD. I think he's eight years old. And this red dot is where that child is looking.
So you get a sense for, okay, obviously he's interested in where she's paying attention. Uh, it gets, you know, the novelty wears off after a while and he starts getting frustrated with her because she's not paying attention to him. Uh, so that was a common thing we saw, actually. It wasn't so much that they weren't interested, it was that the response was kind of like qualitatively different in terms of like, why are you not looking at me? So it was kind of neat. Uh, and we still need to look at that in a, in a more formal way, but you got a little snippet of how that works. We wanted to measure more quantitatively these measures of attention. So, how likely are children with ASD to follow Krista's head turn? So, we have a frequency measure. The number of times that they followed her head turn to where she was looking, divided by the total number of trials. Okay, so you get a proportion of trials that they actually followed where she was looking. No differences. And very overlapping as well. So it's not a, not a power issue. Um, so the groups were equally likely to follow Chris's head turn. Um, this really does contrast with the notion that kids with ASD are uninterested in where people are directing their attention. So this is not what we're finding. The kids with ASD are not interested. And you'll notice that it's not at one. So even the typical kids, you know, they're at 60% of the time they're following. So even the typical kids eventually, and we're going to look at time course as well, because I think initially they're interested and then eventually they're like, what are you doing? You know, they don't continue to follow every single turn because they realize it's not really useful or do, you know, it's not really contributing to the social interaction. What about selection? So I've been making this case for selection being a critical component of this social attention process. Well, how do we measure that? <coughs> Um, so, I measured the latency <coughs> to look at Krista. So, how long did it take each child to initially look at Krista after she had started exhibiting that cue? Right? So, remember, they're playing, they're sorting their cards, and then she is, uh, she's across from them, and then she averts her, her gaze. So, how long does it take them to figure out, to, to look at her initially? So, what we find is that the ASD group is slower than, than the typical group. Okay, so that initial fixation to Krista is slower in autism. So that was significant. What this resulted in, if you measure the latency to follow her gaze cues, so how long did it take them to orient to what she was looking at, that was also slower. But that was because they were slower to initially look at her. Basically, it's sort of a slowing down of the process that it's basically due to this selection process that's different in, in autism. A summary of this particular study, well, kids with ASD were just as likely as typical children to follow the gaze cue. So this is one of the first, to my knowledge, um, experiments where we're testing this in a real-world setting with school-aged kids. So remember I mentioned that all of the studies that have been done with this natural paradigm where you've got somebody facing the other person and delivering these cues in real time has been done with preschool kids and infants, okay? So this is new findings in terms of uh, school-aged children with autism. So they were just as likely to follow where Krista was looking. However, they were slower to notice this, this cue initially. So they, they took longer to look at her and process that she was looking somewhere else. It's not a case of is it there or isn't it, okay? It's really the timing of the behavior or the quality of this behavior that looks a little bit different in ASD. So this is very different to what sort of common understandings of, of how autism looks um, in the sense that it's not that it's, an, it's absent, it's just that it looks a little different. And this is something that's being found repeatedly in my field it's, you know, if you do these types of studies where you have a picture of a person or a picture of multiple people, the people with autism look at the, at the people. They, they, they do inspect the faces. It's not that they're not interested in it. It just looks a little bit different in terms of timing, you know, like how long they stay there, how quickly it takes them to, to look at those cues. I think that, I hope my research has demonstrated to you or convinced you that this process of selecting information in the real world is critical to our understanding of social attention. And this is lost in studies that measure only this shift of attention from the cue to where the cue is looking. So a lot of these studies are missing out on this initial selection process, which I think is really important and tells us a lot about autism.
What are the implications for the real world? Well, if you think about it, things in the real world, events, people, it's dynamic, right? Things are happening at a, a rapid rate, in particular social cues. So people, you know, delivering different social cues in different contexts, it's a, we have a rapidly changing social environment. So if you're a little bit slower to detect these cues and to respond to them, this could have serious impacts on your ability to interact with other people. You might miss out on subtle social cues that, are, that tell you a lot about the social interaction, what's going on, okay? So this is a hypothesis that needs to be studied. Um, however, there is some research that comes out of Peter Mundy's group recently, 2013, um, in autism research. They actually looked at a virtual reality environment. They had a pair of goggles with an eye tracker attached to it or built in. And they had kids with ASD and typically developing kids um, do, practicing a public speaking or a, public, a presentation to a virtual classroom. And what they found was the extent to which children selected the avatars predicted uh, their parent reports and an objective measure of learning, okay, in the classroom. So this, this basic process of attending to other people, selecting them in a, in a real-ish social interaction has effects, it has impacts on performance in, academically. At least that's what this, this data suggests. So this needs to be explored more um, in terms of both the selection process and also how we use cues once, once we've selected them. How do we interpret these cues and use them to direct our attention? What this research suggests is that, is that targeting cue selection, so social, selection of social information as a key mechanism that contributes to social attention in autism. Okay, so this initial selection process might be one way in which we uh, focus our intervention efforts. Um, in particular, the speed with which social cues are, are selected and processed. Okay, so this is something that could be explored. Um, but we need a lot more research to figure out what other variables impact performance in real world situations. There's a huge trend in kind of moving out of the lab into more real world settings. It's a slow process, but you see more and more papers coming out where there's actual a real, a live interaction happening. And so we need to be able to quantify and understand how these processes operate in those settings. So some of um, Dr. Miranda's work has done, uh, looked at contextual variables on eye contact. So um, her work on conversations and how the whether or not children with autism look at the eyes of their conversational partner to the same extent um, as typically developing kids and so things like whether or not this child was talking versus or having a monologue versus having a conversation that impacted whether or not you saw differences in autism so it wasn't the case the case across the board that the kids with ASD were not interested in looking at their partner their conversation partner's eyes. So this is one of those things where we, we need to start exploring contextual variables. And also individual differences. I've gl completely glossed over individual differences in this talk, but um, it's a huge issue in research. We tend to lump everyone together as if they're all the same, but they're not. But it's a pro that's just part of the research process that needs to change. Um, globally when, when we're talking about autism because it's a spectrum and um, I'm very interested in exploring more you know looking at individual differences and seeing um, how these impact social attention. Thanks! <laughs>